Hello, Foreign Integumist viewers. Uh, my name is Rob Farley. I'm at the Patterson School of Diplomacy and International Commerce at the University of Kentucky. With me today is Kelsey Atherton, who has been in a, a, a several uh, blogging heads so far. Uh, how are you doing today, Kelsey? I'm good. I'm good. I'm also, besides showing up occasionally on blogging heads, I am a contributing writer to Popular Science, and I run Grand Blog Tarkin, a science fiction strategy blog. Uh, an issue that uh, we will return to uh, before we're done today. Um, you also have a thriving Twitter feed. Um, so, um, and you storify a ton of stuff, which is actually fantastic because so much of the, so much of what, ha of what happens in Twitter seems to be almost permanently lost, um, really good conversations just sort of lost forever. Um, if nobody records them. So, so as befits our science fiction theme, and we may even verge into fantasy at the end, um, we're going to start today by talking about killer robots. So, um, you've been talking a lot lately about killer robots. People have been talking a lot lately about killer robots. Why not talk about killer robots? Because they're awesome. Um, so I guess what's the state of the art in the conversation about killer robots right now? So there are two – there's a big conversation about killer robots. There's, there's a big – the UN keeps coming back to – circling back to autonomous – Weapons, but there's really two parallel conversations happening um, about killer robots, and they're less conversations but more monologues staring back at each other. We mm -hmm. have, on the one hand, a sort of technical inevitability argument, um, which comes largely from national security circles, that this technology is happening. We've had versions of it going back decades. It's led to more precision and generally less harm, and we're only going to get more of that in the future, and that's where – a lot of defense-minded thinkers come. And then there's a separate conversation, which is these advanced weapons remove control from their human operators mm -hmm. in ways that are new and scary. Um, there's that argument. They're not... The arguments exist in the same space, but there's not really a lot of exchange. Right. Now, I mean, what's interesting... Part of the interesting thing here is that you know, a lot of this conversation seems to revolve around harm mitigation, right? Uh, precision guidance, uh, precision guided weapons that are sort of part of a general strategy of harm mitigation. Um, but that is not fundamentally the reason why sort of the military circles have been interested in the past in precision guidance, right? They've had other reasons to be interested in precision guidance, just as sort of an enhancement for military effectiveness. Um, and so, I mean, it's always kind of seemed to me that the, when the military side people make the argument, sort of the harm mitigation argument that, you know, look, we're so much better than Dresden or than B-52s bombing Hanoi, they are sort of playing, you know, what, what amounts to kind of a little double game, um, because they want the precision guidance anyway. Um, and they, they, they also want to include this harm mitigation, but then it's, you know, on the other side sort of comes after just that harm mitigation argument, but maybe in wrong-headed ways. Right, and this is largely true of um, a general problem that I encounter writing about defense technology is talking about the technology as though the policies it slots into are inevitable. Mm -hmm. um, when people, when the military talks precision weaponry to civilian audiences, often they're they downplay the fact that that it just hits the guy they want. But it mm -hmm. hits the guy they want, and then that it only hits the guy they want is sort of a secondary feature. Mm -hmm. It's important in a lot of like wars, especially the counterinsurgency things, um, generally to minimize civilian casualties. But the military wants it because it hits the guy they want. Mm -hmm. And they spin it as a policy that allows more precision strikes. But we've seen as a, another technology debate – that I'm familiar with, that making the strikes themselves, targeted strikes themselves more precise doesn't necessarily mean removing civilian casualties from the equation. Mm -hmm. And so we're having this, this conversation about technology, about how machines will implement kill orders mm -hmm. um, or make what parts of kill de chain decisions machines will make. And we're treating it as though that will then lead to better military outcomes or fewer civilian dead as an inevitability. And that the policies that would guide it that way are built baked into the technology. Right. So, 
I mean, it's interesting, and I think we need to stop and sort of talk because, you know, sort of talking about what you were just saying in terms of like where the human is in the kill chain, right? Um, because there are, there are definitional issues associated here, right, with, with, in terms of talking about, um, you know, what, what we mean about uh, uh, sort of a killer robot, right? Because, you know, sort of at the extreme, a landmine is a killer robot, right? It, it, it's a, it's a, it, you know, it's a, it's a, um, um, you know, device you put in the ground, and uh, it's obviously indirect. It ends up killing somebody who you have no idea. It's a killer robot in the way that um, sort of an artillery shell is not, right? An artillery shell has a very sort of clear. But you know, then again, the people who don't like autonomous weapons also don't like landmines. So that's that's quite consistent. Um, but you go a step farther, and there are a whole bunch of weapons that we kind of accept are, you know, pretty much fine um, by the laws of war that also have autonomous characteristics, right? I mean, you can start with something like, you know, a, a, a proximity-fused anti-aircraft shell that is launched from a sort of a World War II anti-aircraft weapon, right? I mean, it's you know, has a radar in it, and the radar bounce, 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 and when it gets close... Uh, enough to something, then um, uh, uh, it explodes, right? Which is kind of autonomous. But then you get like homing torpedoes and air-to-air missiles and so forth that, you know, can can figure out what target they want, right? We've all seen Hunt for Red October, right? And the, the homing torpedoes select different targets. Um, so, I mean, how much, how familiar are you with like the debate on what exactly constitutes an autonomous weapon that makes it a lot more complex? It's a, it's- of the debate happening right now is anticipation of a technology that doesn't exist yet. Um, it's There are autonomous features of lots of weapons that presently exist, but people are really worried about what happens 10, 20, 30 years down the road when autonomy itself is much better. And so we have, right? We have homing torpedoes and we have fused bombs and we have like as laser guide missiles and select it, but like cruise missiles do with a GPS or with other map inputs. Mm-hmm and then possible target profiles. We have a lot of autonomous features within weapons that exist right now, but the general worry is that we will, as technology advances, we will move past that. We will have, perhaps not, we'll have rudimentary AI making the decision rather Mm -hmm. than a timer, right? Which a human programs, or at least they program in the factory that this bomb goes off when it hits this, is this close. Mm -hmm. We'll instead have a machine with interpreting and reading and spitting out bullets, perhaps, um, as it responds to stimuli in the environment. And a lot of that technology just isn't there yet. Um, and that's why we're having the debate now as a sort of preemptive constraint, um, or humanitarian measure, depending on how you're arguing it, that wants to make the future less scary. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And so, you know, I mean, I guess that, you know, it is good that we're sort of talking about this thing in advance rather than sort of, you know, uh, aerial bombardment or something like that where we have to sort through afterwards um, what the issue is, or sort of what the issue is going to be. Um, how much of, and this is sort of a frustrating point that I get caught up in, how much is, in your view, how much of the debate over autonomous weapon systems and the problems with autonomous weapon systems. And I don't know if you saw actually the one of these I did with Charlie Carpenter, um, where we talked about like her argument, interestingly enough, was that, um, and I, you know, I like this because you and I both referenced this, uh, this political article by Michael Horowitz and I, you know, I forget the second author, but it had the classic killer robot Terminator up there. And Charlie's comment on this was that in this debate, the only people who ever use images of Terminator and uh, Skynet and, you know, the Matrix and whatsoever, the only ones who use these science fiction issues are the people who oppose regulation of autonomous weapons, right? That um, you rarely see the supporters of autonomous weapons invoking the science fiction themes. It's almost always sort of having it opposed upon them, which is kind of an issue. I don't know if you've seen, have you seen like... I've seen, I've seen some debate of it. The, mm-hmm. the Terminator as straw man. Mm-hmm. is the often the first part of what do we do with autonomous weapons? Well, it isn't like this scary thing mm-hmm. is how people often start to argue that the thing is not scary. Mm-hmm. Right, right. So anyway, how much of the debate over autonomous weapons and about precision guidance more, more generally is, you know, more of a proxy for a foreign policy discussion about sort of how the United States and its allies ought to intervene around the world? 
right? Because there, I mean, there's always like, but it's so much more pleasant than Dresden, right? <laughs> you know, it's so much better than Hanoi. Um, but, you know, so how much of this is just really about the U.S. bombing stuff at all, you know, outside of how precise it is? I mean, I think a lot of it. I'm not, I'm sure there's, there's, there's people obviously very genuinely and legitimately interested in it, but a lot of the way it gets thrown around is the U.S. has the most technologically advanced military. When you are talking, and it's, other countries are, have advanced militaries, have some degree of this technology, but when you are talking about limiting a military technology, the first and obvious target is the U.S. Um, China is developing a tremendous amount of new missiles, um, which will have some selection capabilities as mm-hmm. their anti-ship missiles, anti-carrier missiles specifically, right? How they to fire and make sure they don't hit the cruiser instead. Instead, right. they've got to have some selection capability in there. No one is particularly worried about China's anti-carrier missiles enough to propose UN regulation or UN mm-hmm. motions to constrain them. The United States uses its technology and it uses its precision weaponry all the time. We see it. We see it often in when precision weaponry misfires. It's a huge, huge thrown back in the face of the U S as a like, well, even with your precision weaponry, you messed up. And the, in a large way, the, the drone debate is about how much precision counts and for who. And the constraint is it, is that not that the U.S. is doing smaller strikes? Because they are smaller. They're like anti-tank missiles. It's smaller strikes. But the problem is that they're doing it at all. Mm-hmm. And so when you're debating a technology, the behind the debate is always who is using it presently and what harms are they doing with it? It's easy to, it's hard to argue, and not hard to argue, but to argue against the U.S. having its military power is not something terribly taken seriously. The power exists, but Mm -hmm. to find new ways to argue and constraints on that power, um, technology is a really good way to do it. Right. I mean, and you know, the bringing up, you know, the, the, so, so many arms control and so much, uh, like successful arms control. And I wrote, I wrote a little piece for the national interest on like the five best arms control areas. Um, so much of the most successful arms control is sort of, um, you know, to put it bluntly, let us control the arms of the weak, right? You know, let let, it, let us restrict the power um, of uh, of uh, small countries, right? So let's do nuclear nonproliferation. Let's restrict chemical weapons, um, you know, because weaker countries uh, like chemical weapons, right. or it succeeds because weaker countries like chemical weapons, and big countries don't like them. Um, and you know, the efforts for the autonomous are sort of, or against autonomy, are not, uh, you know, as you've suggested, they're not about ensuring that um, the Chinese can't figure out how to destroy a, uh, uh, aircraft carrier instead of a cruiser. Right. But that's, even though there is certainly a level of autonomy there and the same thing with a homing torpedo or whatever. Right. Um, but you know, the debate is much more sort of considered Western U S British centric in terms of the ways that, um, the most powerful countries in the world are going to want to utilize their military technology. Right. And part of this is also that, Technologies like this, autonomous technologies, like calls for um, restraints on use of um, unrestricted air power that mm-hmm. the U.S. often has with there. Not many countries can do most of the things the U.S. can do, and few and none can do all. Right. Um, right. And there's a tremendous industrial and logistical base all behind that. It's a tremendous infrastructure thing. So it's not few countries lose by saying no to autonomous weapons Mm -hmm. because getting them will be hard Um, and getting the capability that will control them is hard and getting something where you have a human in the loop um, over a remote control, let's say like wheeled robot with a machine gun on it, having a Mm -hmm. human in the loop of that is harder to do just generally as a smaller country um, and as a smaller nation. So there's not a lot to lose, but they are more likely perhaps to f- be on the other end of it from the U S right. to have the U S send in its unmanned whatever's. Right. And so there might be sort of even a sort of a, I, I guess here's another, I mean, here's another aspect of this, right there. 
there is widespread concern, I think, among the people who have a lot of questions about precision guidance munitions, have a lot of questions about autonomous munitions, which are related but different things, we should grant, um, that sort of they breed more war. They breed additional war because they make it rhetorically easier for the United States to undertake force, um, which is a claim that you find a lot, but I don't know has ever been really empirically verified, but you certainly find it a lot. Right. Right. And so the idea being that if the United States can send autonomous autonomous drones and autonomous robots to go and kill things. Um, can, can you lean forward just a bit so that, yes. yeah, because the light right there is behind you. Yeah. Um, that if you can um, sort of have autonomous weapons, then the United States will be ever more likely to engage in destructive, um, in destructive uh, interventions around the world, which has a sort of a face plausibility to it, even if we're, we can't, you know, fully make an empirical connection. Right. And I think... That with all stages of it, with um, we've seen over the past 200 years, certainly a tremendous rise in the technological power of militaries and the technological capabilities. We had gunboat diplomacy, right? That was a thing that the mm-hmm. that wealthy nations could do that other nations couldn't and were then more likely to do. Um, so there's something to it. I don't know. Again, it's again hard to empirically prove or I don't know if it's even possible, but probably possible um, to do, but it's hard to do. And I haven't heard anything, but the idea at least is there that sending in weapons that control themselves or that are remotely remotely linked but largely on their own mm-hmm. means it's easier for countries to put those weapons forward. Um, which is true, but to some extent, but it, and it's I could see the argument there, but it's hard to make that work because again the tremendous logistical tail that goes behind every single thing like this mm-hmm. and the costs of the weapons alone make it very unlikely that we'd be risked out there the uh right. the pilot I, I keep going back to drones it's probably problem of a wheelhouse but the pilots may be in nevada but the ground crew servicing the drones are in afghanistan right um there's still something there and it's the perception may be that the public, to the public and to politicians even, that when this technology goes to war, it goes to war without humans attached. But that's never the reality, and I can't imagine it will be. Right. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna start a train of thought here that's gonna take us to the Star Wars trailer, um, and so I want you to I want you to follow. Um, sort of, some of the defenses of autonomous weaponry have sort of run along these lines, right, that um, it is possible to conceive of autonomous weaponry um, in ways that are both, A, more precise and therefore less likely to incur unwarranted civilian harm, and B, more in line with what we understand the laws of war to be, right, sort of extant laws of war. So the argument being it is possible to build into autonomous weaponry, A, you know, programmed respect for civilian life, programmed respect for law, um, which, you know, I think in general has been, this logic has been resisted by uh, sort of uh, opponents of autonomous weapons who sort of come right. back to, they come back to, you know, fundamentally a responsibility issue here, right, which is that you you still can't hold a robot responsible. Um, and so who are you going to hold responsible? And this is really sort of fundamentally the problem. Um but it's interesting in, in connection with sort of the science fiction issues, right? The, the problem with the Terminator, and the reason the Terminator is always brought up in this and things from the Terminator series, is that sort of even in his benign configurations, um, the Terminator is, a, is not a morally reasoning being. Right. Um, right. I mean, he may be good, he may be bad, but he's good or bad based on, he is fundamentally just a weapon. Right, just a weapon that someone else is firing. Um, The degree of artificial intelligence we see to good effect sort of in the Star Wars universe or to negative effect in something like the Matrix universe is something that's far more complex, right? I mean, it's interesting that when we talk about autonomous weapons, we are never thinking about C-3PO with a handgun, right? Because C-3PO with a handgun seems like something, that's something fundamentally different, right? That, that's a fundamentally different level right. of AI. Right. So we are thinking of 
to tie this in, right? The we see in Star Wars, we see droids, and we see um, the droids in Star Wars have a tremendous degree of autonomy. Um, we have co-pilots, they're machines. They may be pulled apart by for scrap by Wookies, but they are autonomous. They're fully autonomous beings, and that reads different than something operating unchangeable programming as we treat it, right? Terminator is a programmed and set weapon. And so when we, it's not like an uncanny valley, but it's, there's a point where we worry that the weapons will be good enough and autonomous enough to kill all humans, but won't think past that. Right, right. We're thinking, it's very early stage Cylons. Right. Um, to loop that in, we're fine with C-3PO with a blaster and the same reason that we're generally fine sending a 19-year-old to war with an M-16, um, M-14, as uh, M-4 carbons. Anyway, as we're, we're fine sending someone to war with a gun. We're sending a, a young person to war with a gun because we trust that they are an independent moral being, even if a computer could be programmed perhaps to avoid civilian casualties more than maybe a 19-year-old would initially. Um, but we trust the person, and we don't trust the programming. Mm -hmm. And it's such an it's such an interesting space, right? Because, and I can't, you know, my 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 memory of Battlestar Galactica is sort of temporarily failing me. But I, you know, I don't remember. You know, you could presumably, you know, find sort of. You know, because the Cylons are reasoning moral beings, you could find them legally culpable for something right. in the way you can't find a machine, right? Um, and you could presumably even do something, you know, sort of with the sentient programs in the Matrix, right? You know, the, the sentient programs in the Matrix are, are, are morally awful um, in ways, right? We judge them to be morally awful, sort of, although, you know, in both cases, it's like it is a war of both on both, right? So right. Um, there's sort of that going on, but we sort of judge them to be morally problematic. Um, and it's it is this lacuna, right? It's this space in between, and I, I like how you phrased it there. With you know th that we're worried there is something in between uh, a robot that's instructed for law and a robot that can think by itself. That sort of you know leads us to a real problem. And like Asimov just sort of skips this level over, right? His robots have right. have sort of moral reasoning right away, but are constrained by sort of physical um, and, and programming. Um, uh, so I don't know. Yeah, it's it's a really I mean, interesting the type. Stuff back to the thing we can see it in in star wars is the droid army is defeated by the stormtrooper army mm -hmm. no one goes around well i shouldn't say no one there's a lot of people um but no one the battle droid isn't iconic isn't a character in the way we think of the stormtrooper and the stormtroopers are historically terrible mm -hmm. um both in their actions and their competency at those actions mm -hmm. but there's an iconic and they're they are pre-programmed battle clones, at least initially. Mm -hmm. But there's still a human element, and we sympathize with that human element. We understand the grunt. We don't understand the killer robot. Right. Right, and we sort of even there is an element of tragedy that is sort of clumsily depicted, but but that's still sort of there when the stormtroopers turn on the Jedi. Right. right. When the, when when they their 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 humanity is sort of stripped away. What humanity they have is stripped from them. And you know, part of this is that you know really, if you'd given it to a good writer and director, the third movie could have been so much better if it had sort of you know really gone into this right but some of the some of the uh, extended universe stuff has right but it's sort of the stripping of their humanity and reducing them to mere droids that proves to be you know particularly problematic uh, sort of at the end of, in their war against the Jedi um, but in a course sort of something else we were going to talk about is kill switches right um, we were talking about sort of kill switches and um, sort of the weaponry we we send out you know whether whether the United States should sell weaponry to people that has kill switches built in, right? So that ISIS can never use it, right? And there's, right. A, and there's a relationship the, here. That's the exact opposite of an autonomous weapon, really, is something that we can remotely disable. Um, right. And those are far less likely to see, I think. There's mm -hmm. a lot of talk of them. Um, it's a proposed technology solution to a policy problem of 
we give weapons to people we trust and then we shouldn't have trusted them enough or they're, mm -hmm. something's wrong. They drop the weapon, someone else gets the weapons. They sell the weapons, someone else gets the weapons. Weapons mm -hmm. that we made end up in the hands of people we don't like. And wouldn't it be great if we could press a button in Langley, if we mm -hmm. could just remotely disable it all, um, if we could shut down our weapons so that they were only used the way we want them to be used. And that goes against weapon design and honestly diplomacy in a lot right, of ways. Right. Um, John Jekyll had this great conversation about it where no ally will trust you if you start handing out weapons that you can turn off. Um, it makes it really hard to build a coalition. And ultimately, right, the problem to ISIS is not that they're using American weapons. The problem is that they're ISIS. Mm -hmm. And it would be much better if Iraqi security forces using American weapons defeated ISIS, <laughs> right. regardless of what weapons we're using. So we want to make sure that our allies can trust us. We want to make sure that when we provide material support to someone, when we provide military support, mm -hmm. that it works. Um, just for that purpose. So it's hard to do politically, but it's also really hard to do. Um, it's counterintuitive to a weapon designer because if there's a kill switch in weapons we hand out, we may think that we are the only ones with that, but we are really bad at, at securing our own devices. So that kill switch could in turn fall into the wrong hands and they could shut off weapons in the middle of the battlefield. No one wants that. As, as we know, right. Who wants to build in another reason for the F-35 not to work, right? You know, right, <laughs> who right. wants to, to do something that's going to make it even less functional, right? You know, any system you build in and, you know, and obviously there's a great range between your, but the, the idea of a, the idea of a kill switch in a hand unit is also kind of absurd, right? But there's right. a huge range and, you know, that, that it just sort of, from a design point of view, it's sort of deeply problematic, right? And how you would come sort of come up with how this would work and not be immediately sort of counter counter effective. Right. And so that's a similar degree too. When we are talking about weapons controlled remotely in any sense or weapons that are given their own decisions, it's how do we make sure that they make the right ones? Um, mm -hmm. And with when we are doing it now, we hand off weapons to the Iraqi security forces, trusting that most of them will hold on to their guns and fight. Mm -hmm. When we start having wheeled gun bots or autonomous kill towers or whatever we do that we put weapons on and turn on an AI and say target within these parameters, we are hoping it works as we plan. Mm -hmm. But it would be foolish to expect it to work 100%. Um, and it will be... There will be problems and we are, I don't even know if we're at the right point in our understanding of technology to understand how these will work and what they will mean. Mm -hmm. We are trying to restrict something that we haven't really seen. Um, and this ties into the other reading uh, we were talking about. There's this really fascinating talk from um, Gerald Tolkien of air power and he he's writing The Hobbit in... He's writing The Hobbit in the 30s and he's writing Lord of the Rings in the 40s. And he has this obviously tremendous war as a backdrop. But the thing, one of the things he narrows in on, um, at least in correspondence to his son and in letters, mm -hmm. is that the airplane is uniquely terrible. Right. Um, and yeah. the horrors brought by bombers are a special kind of awful. Um, and his son is in the RAF and is actually in a bomber crew at some point, right? And right. so there's like one quoted. So this this comes from a series of essays by Brett Holman, um, who writes a blog, Air Power, something, something. But um, like he he's writing like I I, I he, there was some turn of phrase, right? That that I am so sad that you're connected with this weapon or something along those lines. It is, in fact, a sore trial to me that any son of mine should serve this modern Moloch. Right. Right. Like, it's it's huge, right? The idea that this... That the bomber is the uniquely terrible face of World War II. And World War II gives a plethora of uniquely terrible experiences. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say that... any of the practices used or flamethrower, that a flamethrower, right, is more humane than a bomber. 
Um, it's a very, it's not a great space, but to be staring at the technology as he sees it and see only the tremendous capacity for evil. Um, he relays a story that someone asked him if his son could only be saved by a doctor in the United States, would he support the plane that could fly him to that doctor? And he tosses it off saying there should be more doctors. <laughs> you don't need the plane. Um, which, but it's one of those things where you are so focused on the exclusively negative aspect of the technology. Autonomy is going to end up in weapons in some degree. It already mm -hmm. is in some degree. And it's going to end up more so. But it's going to because autonomy is going to end up in a lot of things. We might find toasters that know when to pre-make toast. No one's going to be terribly objected to right. that. And I'm not saying that obviously that a better toaster justifies a killing robot. But they may even be they may even be connected to your phone, which reads from your hand how sweaty you are on that particular day, which you know could even then sort of lead to some sort of question about how 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 much you like your toast when you have a particular when you're hungover, right? When I'm hungover, I like my toast more burnt because there's more carbon and it takes away the pain. But or something along those lines, right? right? And so the first, also like the first autonomous robots we're going to see, and it's curious that like the focus is all on killer robots, but the first autonomous robots that are likely to end up in the battlefield are going to be drivers. Mm -hmm. We are going to have convoys that will drive themselves. Um, that was DARPA started a project in the mid -aught, mid early aughts. They wanted to. That was convoys were dying in Iraq. That was their solution was what if we just, rather than better patrols and up armoring and making mm -hmm. this huge security production, what if we made it so that humans didn't die in these, that we just had, just driving straight routes, vehicles drive themselves, and we're seeing mm -hmm. degrees of that in autonomous cars now, which are going, which have right. been developed by Google and others, but that's the kind of, that's the first kind of autonomous which then then sort of, see. But leads into the question, right, when does your Google car decide to kill you, right? Under, under what circumstances does your Google talk car take active active steps to kill you, right, sort of in order to um, avoid, you know, running over a bus full of people or something like that, right? Right. Well, we either hope we have a good answer to the trolley problem when we program these Google cars. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I, I want to get back to the talk, I mean, sort of get back yeah, to the yeah, talk yeah, for a bit and then go over and then shift over to and end up with Star Wars, right? Um, you know, th that exchange, the exchange, and, and we'll have a link to it from the website, was so... and. Tolkien was always sort of loath to allow that there were direct analogies to anything in his work. And um, Holman is also sort of reluctant to make this claim, especially given Tolkien's reluctance. But, um, you know, it sheds light on so many questions like, you know, the particular horror of Smaug, right? That, you know, Smaug is air power and fire and the incineration of cities and the potential for the incineration of cities. Um, and it shed light, sheds light on sort of one of the age-old questions. Why didn't, you know, and, it's the, and the Christopher Tolkien part, right? Again, right. And why didn't they just ride an eagle and drop the ring down Mount Doom, right? It's because, you know, fundamentally that is misusing the means in and of itself. Right. 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 Tolkien imbues the eagles themselves with such a power of... He has this idea, right? The, the canon explanation is that... Mm -hmm the ring would overpower the eagles and that's why they couldn't just fly straight to there. But the idea that air power, right? He gives us majestic eagles in this. Mm -hmm. He gives us um, a good symbol if he wanted of air power, mm -hmm. but is so easily and immediately corruptible. Right. Um, because the other one, he, ref he references the uh, Nazgul birds. Mm -hmm. um, the fell beasts. The fell beasts, the right, and and smog himself. It's the specter of destruction that cannot be prepared for or halted in any capacity. That it arrives and then it's total. Um, and it's also interesting that Tolkien, you know, he served in the trenches in World War One, and the lesson that so many people took from the trenches in World War One was that air power was potentially this saving grace, right? That air power could fight wars more cleanly and everything else. And it's fascinating that he took exactly, sort of exactly the opposite conclusion, that however horrible the trenches may be, that the bombing was worse. And it's also, so this is another big thing, right, that we get at with precision and we get at with mm -hmm. autonomy and we get at and other stuff, is there are only soldiers in the trenches. 
everybody lives in the city. So when you're bombing a city, you're targeting, even if you're bombing the base attached to a city, you're bombing that base and you're probably getting civilians too. And so the air power skips past the people whose role it is, whose task it is, whose mission it is, is to like encounter and survive violence. Um, and it just hits the vulnerable populations. It gets the soft underbelly. Mm -hmm. And Tolkien's whole thing, his whole, what we know him for, right? His whole vote is making sure that the soft underbelly is never touched. They right. flee the Shire. They do everything. They go to hell to save the Shire. And then the most tragic element is that the Shire has been corrupted by the time they get home. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, to sort of skip away from Tolkien for a second and to the other uh, sort of gigantic world-spanning um, um, uh, 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 film uh, situation. Jurassic World. What do you? Oh no, I'm sorry. No. Um, so we have we have a new trailer for, and we had referenced Star Wars a little bit earlier, but we have a new trailer for um, Star Wars. So um, while we're here, I mean, there's really only one autonomous robot in the, that uh, is part of this particular trailer. But what are your thoughts on uh, having watched this uh, particular uh, trailer? I don't know if Blogging Heads has had a a long commentary, but you know we're we're gonna have one now. So what what do you what do you think? What what was your thought on the trailer? And I thought it did a really good job of portraying the universe as in the original trilogy, um, rather than the glistening nothing of the uh, the prequel trilogy that mm -hmm. Lucas concocted. It does a really good job of getting the grittiness of the universe, but it also. Um, <laughs> And this was a lot of the conversations I saw flying around is it references a it's set 30 years after Return of the Jedi. Um, it's set. You get a post-war feel to it or you get a later stages of that war. You get. Um, you get shaky cam on stormtroopers. There's and not that there was wasn't shaky cam originally in any of it, but you get a lot more immediate sense of danger and peril that even the stormtroopers themselves are jumping into combat. It looks like they're actually about to step out of like a V-22 ramp, but they're mm -hmm. getting into combat and the outcomes are unclear. Right. Um, right. We open with a, um, with John Boyega as in stormtrooper armor. And we have no idea if he's a stormtrooper or a, a lap stormtrooper, a character donning it as disguise, but we have a universe that is reeling from the fall of an empire that is still struggling. Mm -hmm. right. right. And we're going to, I imagine we're going to see a lot of that. Um, the only other really strong sign we see of military power besides the shaky stormtroopers and their um, jump ship is we see three X wings, newer, shinier X wings, mm -hmm. um, flying around. And while the X wings are new, there's uh, another clip later that has tie fighters and the Millennium Falcon and the tie fighters look just the same as they always have. Right. Um, so we're seeing a we're seeing a universe, obviously, um, post -war, further along in this conflict, but the conflict mm -hmm. is still going on, right? Yeah. the The events of the original trilogy take a few years, mm -hmm. um, if I recall correctly. It, or, it's a very short amount of time. Yeah, I mean, I think there's I think there is supposed to be in canon. It's supposed to be I think three years between the first and second movie, and then another right. year and a half or so between the second and third. Yeah, I think so. The uh, Wikipedia dates everything as after Battle of Yavin. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a we have a very short time span for that first one, which is a kind of war span Americans are well we're used to, and now we have a thirty years war um, still happening, or at least a war still happening after thirty years if the conflict hasn't been continuous, mm -hmm. and that's going to be a very different feel. I'm really really intrigued to see right. how it plays out. Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, I don't know if you saw Colbert last night. Did you see Colbert's expla explanation oh, no, last night? There was a fantastic explanation of the uh, the lightsaber with the hilt, um, and he sort of you know it, here's his in universe explanation. It was just it was just really it was extremely well done. I guess it was the night before last, but um, you know I'm old enough to remember being really excited by the uh, first Phantom Menace trailer. Um, so you know obviously I'm reserving I'm reserving my enthusiasm um, for exactly how this is going to play out. But, yeah, but I haven't. I, you know, I guess I hadn't really. It had occurred to me at the time, but I hadn't really thought through the implications of, you know, the, the stormtrooper, which is such a negative figure in culture, 
in American culture and thinking, being the saving grace in the first trilogy, right, in the prequel trilogy, right, and so fascinating, sort of thinking of that too, right, that, that you know, our concern about autonomy, even when we are presented with extremely benign examples of autonomous technology, right. um, that it is still sort of the semi-human stormtroopers that are, you know, the positive answer to those autonomous beings. Right. But it seems like in this one, right, I mean, the, the level of technology and the level of industrial capacity and everything else has dropped sufficiently that, you know, people just can't build droid armies anymore. I mean, that's sort of one of the explanations, right? They certainly can't right. come up with clone armies anymore. Um, is, is sort of one of the implications of, of, of what we see, or is an interpretation of the, of the 4, 5, 6. Right, and we have, and it looks right, every time we see the Empire um, in the first trilogy, it's got its tremendous ships, it has this embarking, it's building multiple planet-destroying laser battle stations. Mm -hmm. But that... Largely masks, right? They're recruiting troopers. They're no longer cloning them and building up clone armies that way. They're you can enlist in the Imperial Academy. Luke thinks about doing it um, mm -hmm. to be a pilot. There, we are seeing an empire that has all the. I mean, their starfighters are terrible, right? Their star and their, their starfighters are, are terrible. terrible. Yeah, right. No, I think we were uh, on Twitter talking that they are the uh, MiG twenty one of space. Right. Um, if you need something and you have no reasonable expectation of an opponent, then it's what you had, then it'll work, but mm -hmm. don't count on it ever. So we have, so they have their, this tremendous expense, but it's very much the, um, the Tarkin doctrine, um, is about using the Death Star as a cost saving mechanism mm -hmm. right. that if you can destroy a planet at will with one station, it doesn't matter how slow the station is that that fear alone is enough to keep the rest of the galaxy in safe. And that's almost a, that's the kind of policy you come up with when you are worried about resources. Right. Um, when you think your power might be finite or might be dwindling, you come up with something that scares everyone into submission after you've already won. Right. That's not necessarily a position of strength in and of itself to be looking at that as a tool. Right. I mean, it's most closely associated with MAD doctrine in the United States, right, which is also associated with a reduction in the defense budget, right? Right. I mean, we are going to invest in these this planet-killing weapon, nuclear weapons, because we don't want to pay for the expense of having uh, less powerful weapons, right? I mean, right. It's, it's this sort of bizarre historical irony, right? But thinking about the Death Star in those terms is also really interesting. Yeah. There's more of that at Blog Tarkin. Right. <laughs> All right, well, um, I don't know. Do you have anything else on autonomous killing machines? I mean, I'll eat my hat if I find out that that rolling droid in the in the trailer ends up wielding a lightsaber and is the protagonist, but that's well, about it. Frankly, your hat looks like it could be eaten. So, um, I mean, it looks like it may crawl off of your head at any moment, and you might have to stab it with a fork. So, you know, to bring up another uh, film series, let's say it's like something on the Adams Family, right? Crawl there. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. All right, well, Kelsey, this has been fantastic. Uh, let's absolutely. do this again soon, and maybe, you know, after we see one of these uh, next movies coming up. So, yeah, Absolutely. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye.